Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by Stephen Erickson as we talk about Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Hey Steve. Hello, how are you? I am doing very well. Well, apart from the migraines, which are just a delight. Um, yes. But Star Trek's Strange New Worlds, what, what do we think of, of episode one? Well, when we did talk about um, doing this episode, uh, I'm assuming the title is going to be The Return of Star Trek because it was absolutely fabulous. It was terrific. Um, so much so that, you know, when I was, and I, I think I've watched, I've watched all of Discovery. Um, I don't know why I put myself through that, but each time, you know, at the end of the hour, it was, my, my sense was, you know, that's another hour I'm never going to get back because it was just atrocious. I've watched uh, Strange New Worlds now twice in the last four days. That's how good it was. But I felt much the same way, except the latter half of Discovery season four, I thought yeah, 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 yeah. Was, was finally moving in that direction. And it wasn't just about the, the tonal shift in Discovery moving away from battle and into resolving things. But it was the actual inclusion of the crew as major elements of the story instead of everything revolving around Burnham. And yeah. And but but for me, that's it's three seasons too late. <laughs> well, you know, well, it really is. I, it, no, it's, I'm... yeah, it's extraordinary. Um I mean, the missteps of discovery just seem to be constantly compounding. And uh, I've just yeah, at that point, uh, you know, and then I've, I've watched Picard second season. Um, and maybe we can talk about that at some point, but uh, this one, yeah, what a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Um, because I was really, really impressed with it. it so much so that I, I was, before we started recording, I was saying, I might actually do a couple of different videos on the elements yeah. and try to really break them down as to how they did them that, that made it so successful. Because one of the, the things that I liked about this is almost every single scene served at least a dual purpose yeah. in the episode, whether it was showing you something that was happening and providing backstory, showing you something that was happening and giving you character uh, depth, showing you something that was happening and adding to the lore of the world, <laughs> showing you something like an exploring theme that every single scene had elements that served multiple purposes and yet when i contrast that to a lot of the scenes in say discovery or picard which were one note this scene is about and yet it it just seems like a a brand new writing team a brand new approach where they went no we we have a short space of time how can we make everything fit together? How can every single scene deliver the maximum amount of information, emotion, and punch? And I mean, I mean, we can go through it structurally. Let's let's look at pacing. You know, this was the first time where you didn't feel this breathless, frenetic kind of weirdo stuff that then, you know, with Discovery especially. Would then suddenly pause so everybody could pontificate in, in amidst all the action uh, in order to get their message across and then resume the story. Um, this was seamless in, in that respect. And I just had a sense, even the second time around, because I was paying attention to it, it takes its time on its scenes. It actually takes its time. Um, so those moments where you know Pike is is in his in his room or um, you know, he's looking out on, on that arcology that's floating around in space and, and it just took its freaking time and it was so nice. It was so refreshing. But it, it's not that it was long and drawn no. out. Like, um, no. like one of the scenes that, it, that springs to mind very early on in the episode is when uh, Pike has initially come back to the Enterprise to perform this rescue mission. And he is he is completely unsure of being in command. Mm -hmm. He is torn. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's having a crisis of faith, a crisis of con uh, confidence, suffering from PTSD, mm -hmm. 
and he sits in that chair. He's gone through the motions. He sits down in the chair and they've gone round. They've introduced basically all of the bridge crew. We know who they are, what position they hold, what their job is. We get a little sense of who each of them are. And it's done in a way of before you leave space dock, is every station ready? So it fitted with that. And as Pike's sitting there, he looks down to his console arm on the chair and he catches that reflection and yeah. sees this image of his disfigured face and he becomes arrested by it he is drifted off he is not present in the moment and everyone on the bridge crew starts to react they they go where's the order and they all sort of turn to look at him and the scene holds that for a couple of seconds until yeah. spock basically clears his throat and it's like captain you know the sort of questioning and even then pike doesn't immediately snap to and go oh right let's do this he he sort of comes out of his reverie again another just it's just a couple of seconds but it holds that uncomfortable silence mm -hmm. and then he he looks out and he's slouched in his chair he's not he's not sitting in command and it he's he then says like head it or i can't even remember the exact words but it's not done with authority no, and no. you can see the crew is slightly shaken and then when he gives his speech the inspiring to oh we're going to go and rescue our friends it then descends into no one's going to die this day mm -hmm. and it takes a very dark turn instead of Doesn't the it? the inspiring speech and then that scene when we contrast that very very deliberately with the identical scene at the end where the whole crew is assembled again they they have the ship mm -hmm. he sits down they go round the room again and this time he's sitting there and yeah he's still slightly sl slouched but now he is sitting there in absolute command he is entirely present and there's almost like the twinkle in his eye as he looks mm -hmm. out and goes hit it that that's yeah. the transition over the entire yeah. show for his character arc yeah yeah and, and it's fantastic and i mean i guess you know at some point i'm sure when you go into detail on this stuff but um his presence uh the actor's presence uh when he steps onto you know onto the ship um it's palpable um as he's the captain of the ship, you know, regardless, regardless of his crisis and all the rest, when he walks onto that bridge, he is the captain of the ship. And um, yeah, really nice to see. Nice to see. And there's so many callbacks to, you know, the way he is playing this role um, in very much a kind of homage to, to William Shatner and, and Kirk. Um, as you say, there is there's a camaraderie, there's a slight twinkle, um, that sense that he could crack a joke at any time and, or somebody else does, and he could actually laugh and be part of it. Um, and it's, it's casual and it's relaxed in terms of how he is, um, embracing this role as an actor. And that's just, wow. I mean, yeah, it's really nice to see. And uh, well, for that acting choice, what I thought was really interesting is, you know, uh, when Uhura is introduced, he goes, oh, the prodigy. Uh, Ensign Uhura. And you can see it's yeah. very relaxed when he's talking, he's putting her at ease. And then we contrast that when the moments, uh, say when Singh is arguing with Spock uh, on the bridge about whether or not to put the shields up. And it's very, very similar to that uh, discussion that Kirk always intervened in between Spock mm -hmm. and McCoy, that yeah. these two people are arguing. And Pike listens to both sides and then goes, do that he makes the command decision and it's yeah. not folksy it's not uh relaxed it's that's no i'm making the decision that's it and it's a sense of command yeah. and then like everything happens blah, blah blah we have the repercussions of that and it's he has those moments when when it's nothing's happening he is absolutely fine with uh being a human being but mm -hmm. when it comes to matters of command he will not be argued with once no. he's his decision and i thought the the moment in the elevator when they've rescued number one and the two blue shirts that is the turning point in the episode for pike 
uh, he sees again that reflection, that mm -hmm. uh, disfigured future that he is facing, and he makes a decision. And that's when he turns back and says, right, this is what we're doing. Number one initially sort of stands up to him, and then it's, well, okay, the captain's made his decision. And they all beam away. And Pike has, nope, this is what we're doing. I have made my decision. We're going to do that. So there's this wonderful movement that he shows that he is very relaxed in his position. He's comfortable in the skin of the character. Yeah. Um, he throws in folksy remarks and idioms repeatedly in the show. Like it, mm -hmm. he does it a couple of times and they flag it. They have him say something to Spock and he goes, oh, it's, uh, it's just an expression. I'm all ears and it, it's just an expression. He says it to the aliens. He said, you know, and they flag it a couple of times to go, yeah, this is a trait that we're going to use for mm -hmm. him going forward. Um, but I think one of the one of the moments that I really liked about Pike as a an illustration of his command style and character is the moment in the med bay with Ensign Noonien or Lieutenant Noonien mm -hmm. Singh. And I need to remind me to ask you about that in a, uh, her in a second. But she refuses the sedation for the procedure. And instead of just looking at her and ordering it, he walks over, sits down next to her and asks why. And like, are you sure? Like, do you know what's going on? She basically lays out, yes, I understand all of the repercussions. And he's like, okay, I'm not going to order yeah. you to do it. I trust my crew. Yeah. And that, that I think is the moment. He listens to his crew. He trusts his crew to make the right decision because that's why they're on the crew. He's not second guessing them. Yeah. Um, and that I thought just shows the, the ease at which, with which he commands as a character. I, yeah. I thought it was a brilliant moment. The, the close personal nature of it, of you're under my command and I have to look after you. You have made this decision knowing what's going on. Okay, I trust you. Go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we contrast that with, um, say, Discovery, where it's, no, Burnham is always right. Yeah, and arguments all over the bridge. And, and yeah, people shouting at each other. And it's like, what? A, yeah, it, it's night and day. It really is. But, they, but people shouting each other on the on the bridge, one of the things that distracted me all the time in Discovery, they're in the middle of a battle and it's, we have to do this thing now because yeah. and they have a conversation and you yeah. go, you're the tactical officer, be looking at your console. They're only five feet behind you. They can hear you. Mm. In this episode, when they're relaying the information, her is the only one who looks away from her console to talk to the captain. And even then, she's still holding the communication thing in her ear. And yeah, and it's a callback to her character in the original series as well. Because she, yeah. she always spun around to she talk. spun to around, her. yeah. Um, but everyone else focused on their console, relayed the information, and trusted that the captain was listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's little tiny changes like that, that when you add them all up, when they're done badly, even though it's only a small issue, when you have lots of tiny issues, they build up to create yeah. a very faux impression and make you more inclined to be negative. But when you have lots of little things done very, very well, even when you get to a sort of hand wavy moment, mm. which there are a couple in this episode, like I, I did have some minor quibbles, but even when you get to one of those hand wavy moments, you go, no, they've already gotten my trust. They've already gotten me to suspend my disbelief and to forgive so much because everything else is there. Yeah. Well, OK, let, let's look at this in terms of the dynamic of this discussion. Normally, what, what happens when people are doing reviews is you begin with all the praise and then you go to the quibbles. And so then, you know, the end of the discussion is, is all the things that, you know, we have problems with or whatever. And, you know, they're minor, but because they come at the end, they, they, they lend a flavor to the particular discussion. So why don't we get the, the quibbles out away and done in the middle of this? And then we can go back to the praise at the end. Okay. So um, 
that that sounds good to me. Do you have any quibbles that you would like to raise? I do, I do, and and they are minor, and they're um, they're about background authenticity, if you will, and so that has to do with the first contact team led by number one is not a first contact team. I mean, in, in any universe I can think of, there's no diplomats, there's no sociologists, there's no psychologists, there's no exoanthropologists, whatever you want to call them. Um, you've got two engineers and- No, and two leaders. astrophysicists. Astrophysicists. And number sorry. one. Yeah, yeah. So, and it would have been easy to fix in the writing room. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what happened there, obviously, but I, I don't think anybody raised their hand at this point saying, you know, this kind of doesn't make sense, but it would have made sense if, as you and I discussed, um, they picked up an anomalous signal related to the warp, warp weapon technology testing and had just gone to look and were then um, bushwhacked basically. Um, and with a, maybe uh, a, a close proximity uh, detonation of one of these uh, missiles which then knocks out their, their systems. So they can't communicate the ship's failing um, and they have to beam down to get arrested. Or and take the shuttle down. Or is take it, the shuttle down. Yeah. Because the, one of the, the issues that I had, cause I had, we, we obviously both had the same problem with this, that here's this big spaceship. I know, I know it's not as big as enterprise, but it's a big disc with a, with a nacelle. It's not a small ship and there's only three people on it. It's only three people on it. Yeah. Which um, they needed. Right, because that's how you, you can rescue three people. Rescuing 30 people is a whole different beast, right? And the way they've always done it in other shows is, yeah, the main people are all held in a pen somewhere. And then the, the officers are held somewhere else. The way that they used to do in POW camps. And so you would have one team beam down and they manage to beam everyone up to whatever rescuing ship. And it's you cut to that show and them set up the mast beaming technology, whatever they need. They uh, pattern buffers or mm. blah 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 and then the main focus is on infiltrating the command layer to to get the the essential team away we've seen that done not only in star trek in multiple iterations but in lots of tv shows yeah but the reason i bring up they should have used a shuttle and not i agree I uh, beaming down is we've gone back to original trek where there's a guy handling the beaming who beamed them down? <laughs> Did they, I, I put it on a delay. Is it like a photo timer? I've said it, <laughs> run it, everyone pose. And then they get beamed down. It, yeah, original series. Yes, you can do that. Um, and it was done. Yeah. And it just, that, that was one minor note that it was three people, two of them astrophysicists. You go astrophysicists who'd be really good at scanning anomalies. Yeah. Hmm. That First was like, First contact, not so much. Yeah. Um, so that that was a minor quibble mm -hmm. because ultimately it's about two lines of dialogue and you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, moving on. Like it, that isn't as important as the thing that happens. Yeah, but yeah. it just, it was a slightly discordant note where you went, you've gotten everything almost pitch perfect thus far. Why have a discordant note? Okay, I'll share one. When Spock is doing the cliched, I'm going to use the scanner and it's going to fail the first two times and then something will happen and it'll work the third time. This, this is one of those overused tropes and cliches that I am so, I am so over and so done with mm. because it's, oh, look, we need to reprogram the computer so you swipe your card, but we can only do it while you are there. You go, Why not just do it ahead of time so it works? And every time it's always they swipe, swipe, as, oh, we're going to get it. Just try it one more time. Oh, look, it worked that time. And the security guard goes, oh, okay, then. Instead of, no, it failed the first two times. This isn't normal. Come with me anyway. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> specifically say to um, the chief who looks like he, he's very young to be the, the chief engineer in charge of beaming people. The crew is very young in general. They are, yeah, that's, that, that is a quibble, but yes. But he beams down the vial of, or the fluid from the vial onto Spock's right eye, which is the eye that is being scanned. 
how did he know to beam it down onto the right eye? And also, this was meant to be a treatment to go into Spock's blood to change his genes. This wasn't a fluid going over the eye, but the beaming happens on his eye and only one eye, and it's the eye being scanned. And you go, really? Yeah. That, and, and again, I appreciate it was the, the slightly faux tension of, oh, how are they going to get in? It's to add drama to the scene of a, a time period where something has to be done. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But it, it kind of was a wee bit hand wavy. And a wee bit, yeah. I mean, <laughs> basically, the transporter engineer is told to basically invent um, a brand new uh, application of transporter technology. Uh, it, it's it, the other aspect, of course, is you're right about if they had taken a shuttle down, then then the the civilization uh, down there has no knowledge of transporters which then becomes fairly important, right? Um, because if you can rescue somebody by simply beaming them out, they, and if they didn't, don't witness it, then they don't know how these people were rescued. So that would have been an added, um, you know, uh, high tech uh, surprise for the, for the denizens of this planet. And that could have been used and that would have made good sense. And then of course, when at the end, when Pike beams down into the middle of the conference room, it's a shock for everybody for, multiple reasons. And it's also re -emphasize, or emphasizing everything that um, the Federation has to offer in terms of the future for this civilization. Because this is something, you know, they don't have and obviously have, have no concept of. So yeah, like, like I'm saying, that white writer's room needed that one person to raise a hand just every now and then, and could have sorted this just effortlessly. But but in saying that, I mean, those are both um, those are both such a minor, yeah, they are minor quibbles that um, you you really feel like I think the writers, the writers room, the, the writing team, uh, the showrunner, the producers, everyone came together on this mm -hmm. so well to create something that is watchable, is understandable. You don't even need to have seen discovery to understand what happened and who pike was because they fed enough of that in in the episode uh, so you got enough of yeah. the backstory to understand it you don't need to have watched the original series to know who pike is um no, no. They, everything was in this episode and i'm so impressed with that we get who the crew are what their roles are some uh, idea of different relationships and relationship dynamics in the crew. The fact that uh, Dr. Mbenga and Nurse Chapel know each other, work well together and have good rapport. Nurse Chapel meeting uh, Uhuru and having a smile and a bit of a joke while in the middle of doing something. The banter and the repartee among the crew. Number one, having a previous uh, interaction with uh, Nuni and Singh. Pike having the uh, relationship with Spock and number one, that there are all these different dynamics at play and it's crossing different divisions and boundaries within the ship. So you yeah. can see that it's going to be a nice ensemble cast where there are different interactions. It's not just uh, the engineers have relationships and, and dialogue with other engineers. The medical staff just have discussion with medical staff. You know, it's there's actually a mix. They're not being ghettoized or, or blocked off into very specific areas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one just sort of senses that <clears throat> there is a natural and very real sort of onset um, camaraderie among the actors and, and, and the roles. Um, it just felt comfortable. You know, it's hard to pin these things down, but, um, but one of the other things, of course, is when you're looking at something like this, which is making conscious callbacks to the original series, more than any of the other series, obviously. Um, you can do that in terms of paying lip service to that original series. Um, so you make the gestures to make you know everybody be happy they recognize the Easter egg or whatever. 
or, and I think this is what I sensed here, they went back and looked at the original series and figured out what worked. And those are the callbacks now. So the moment of Pike appearing in the conference room is a classic Kirk moment. And he gives his speech and then he leaves it to them. And I mean, Kirk Shatner would have done that multiple times in, in the original series without pulling on a phaser, without, you know, massive action. He's just, here's the logic of the situation. Um, choose now. It's but, brilliant. But to me, that scene where he beams down and lays it out for them is uh, an echo of the scene that he'd had with Noonie and Singh. We, he yeah. beamed down and went, right, you're about to make a decision. I know that you're going to make this decision. Do you understand the ramifications of your decision? Do you understand the context? Right? You do? Okay. It's still your decision. I yeah. will leave it up to you. I'm not going to enforce anything. But I needed to make sure, because I'm now responsible for your planet, I needed to make sure that you understood the ramifications. Yeah. And so it is a, an absolute echo of exactly what he did with the security officer that we see play out on a much grander scale. Yeah. And oh yeah, yeah, it's unified within the story, but it's also this wonderful callback to the original series um, that honors the original series. The, those moments of, you know, people mock them now, I suppose, in some respects, but you know, the moments of pontification by by Kirk as he delivers, you know, the lines he delivers. Um, there was a lot of value in that stuff. And, you know, people can roll their eyes now, and, but I can go back to the original series and still, you know, be be impressed by, I mean, the writing quite, quite often more than anything else, you know, the things that are being said. And I was impressed with the writing here. There are some really good lines. There are some really thoughtful, interesting philosophical um, explorations that are going on here. I mean, the whole notion, I love the notion of the, and, and if you go back, Kirk had his moments like this um, that revealed sort of later on in episodes of past traumatic events that have shaped him and have really guided him as, as a character. Um, and you get that here as well, but there's, there's a subtextual level on the whole thing. There's, so you've got the post-traumatic stuff for Pike. And I think that that's a very, very useful driving force that sits behind all of this, because it's not just the specifics of uh, the damage that he physically took and his eventual demise. Um, on a broader question, you can, you can basically say that this is, this is about aging. It's not about Spike or Pike specifically, it is about aging. It is about the, the kind of slow disfigurement that we all experience as we get older and we have to come face to face with that. And he faces it quite directly. So metaphorically, it's, it's all there. Um, and it's not the instance of, well, okay, I'm, I know I'm gonna die in 10 years. It, it's no, it's just, I know I'm gonna die. You know it's what I mean? So there's a whole subtextual thing going on. Yeah. It, it's the absolute Universal. awareness of yeah. mortality. So it's not just, yeah. you know, the, the conception, I know I'm going to die at some point. It's no, no, I know I am going to die. Yeah. And I love, I love that moment where he thinks about it. And he said, you know, is 10 years a long time? Mm -hmm. Because suddenly, you know, 10, is 10 years a long time? Well, 10 years is a long time. Well, not in as soon as you put the context around it, you can change whether 10 years is short or long. Yeah. And that, that is what he's considering. Yeah. And then further to that, the, the doubts that he has, am I going to be too reckless because I'm convinced mm -hmm. I'm immortal until that happens. Mm -hmm. And therefore he'll be reckless, not only with himself, but his crew whom, for whom he is yeah. responsible. Yeah. Or is he going to be too conservative because he fears this death because it isn't just that he saw it, he lived it, he felt it with the, the PTSD. He is reliving that yeah. moment every single time. Yeah. That because he fears it so much, is he going to be too conservative? Is he yeah. going to be too cautious? And, you know, as a captain, Kirk was always, you know, trying to find that balance between being impulsive and being uh, cautious. That that's, that's the sweet spot 
in command. Yeah. And we see that with with Janeway, we see it uh, with Archer, we see it with Cisco, that these commanders all had the uh, these captains all had their different styles, but they were always weighing up the benefits of the different positions. Then they make their decision and go with it. Yeah. And <clears throat> to have him worry about this shows that undermining of his confidence, the undermining of everything that he thinks about himself. Yeah, and, and and the lines were delivered so well. I mean, the only problem I have with that, that's the Spock Pike scene in, in Pike's room is he knows the time, how long it's gonna to take to get to the planet. So to leave the bridge and say, you know, call me when we arrive, no problem. But to go into his room then and then pull out the brandy is a problem, right? <laughs> well, it's it's actually like he's obviously been in his room for a long time because they're about they get the call at the end of that conversation that they're about they to arrive. So this it must be several hours later. So it's it's not like he's having brandy first thing in the morning. Yeah, I, it was kind of strange. Yes, but 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 again that that cliche of oh I'm feeling stressed I'll have a drink uh, to calm my nerves and yeah it's saurian brandy synth the hall or whatever the star trek equivalent is but yeah as the captain on duty yeah it, it no, was a slightly done. bum note and i think we we had discussed this and i'd suggested a partial way to do it would be he's reaching for it when spot comes in because spot comes in he moves his hand and picks up something else instead yeah and i i, I have an issue with that as well i don't think that i think it's the wrong signposting yeah uh, completely but, yeah but that's that's you know when we talk about a writer's room and we talk about what writers do it's yeah. you kick ideas around like that to try and find the the good idea that is doing all of the things that you need it to do without any of the negatives from the the other ideas that you have rejected i don't think yeah. it's a perfect solution but you know that's why i'm not a professional writer and i don't work in a writer's room well and of course what we saw him initially was what appeared to be a fairly healthy lifestyle in that in that ranch in, in Montana, making fantastic breakfast, um, going out and riding. There's no reaching for the for the booze, right? So it, but, it, it kind of rings a, a false note. Yeah. You know? But the one of the interesting things with that is while on the surface level it looks good and healthy and it's mm -hmm. pretty much mm -hmm. like uh, William Shatner and uh Kirk always having those ex uh, escapades where they go riding or they're they're in on a ranch somewhere because yeah Shatner liked it yeah or walk, walk, rock but, climbing or whatever yeah. but his beard <clears throat> is unkempt his hair is unkempt he's not answering his communicator he is clearly troubled oh yeah this is a retreat this is a safe space and he's having a um uh, a relationship outside of wedlock because you know it's the future mm -hmm. but with <laughs> With, yeah, you don't get that now yeah. uh, with a another captain not mm -hmm. someone who is subordinate no someone of equal rank and treats her as equal rank and shows the it, it's sort of like that save the cat storytelling how do we trust that he's a good guy because she's still lying in bed and he's making her breakfast mm -hmm. oh what a sweetie mm -hmm. he might be suffering from ptsd and about to lead people into danger but he made that woman breakfast one time and you buy into him being good yeah, and it's a competent breakfast, right? They're perfect pancakes, as opposed to, you know, an absolutely mashup of, of horrible stuff and, and, you know, overcooked and burnt, which would have told a different side of things, right? Yeah. So um, he's capable of control despite, um, or rather attention to detail despite the PTSD, yeah. but not on his person. <clears throat> yeah. So that, that is high functioning, but... Yeah the signals are still there that there is a problem that something yeah. is wrong and and that's and that's the the captain's personality trait for i would think for all of the captains they're high functioning regardless and, of but again this is what i was saying about like all of these scenes do double duty yeah Th this do. was a way of establishing yeah he's a captain he can do all of these things but look at the state of his hair look at his beard he he isn't quite right they talk about it um, mm -hmm. And then we see that, you know, he's he, on the ranch the, the, uh, with the horse. It does lead to that very on the nose line of, I need you to get back on that horse, Captain. You yeah. Know, even yeah. for Star Trek, you go, that is a little on the nose as he's standing next to a horse. 
Well, I think at that moment, I, I certainly would have, you know, as a director, I would have said, roll your eyes at that one, Pike. Yeah. <laughs> because there's nothing to stop a, an admiral or anybody else from, you know, voicing a bad joke. Yeah, yeah. cracking a dad joke and everyone yeah. groaning in response. Yeah. And Which would have been cool. Um, but, I, you know, so much of this episode, uh, they even the moment when he arrives to see the Enterprise, and I like I remember talking to you about in Star Trek, Great the motion moment. picture, that really long lingering look as Kirk flies in on the shuttle to look at the beauty of the Enterprise. And for me, being closer to the modern audience than say you are, um, that moment in star trek the motion picture lasted too long it was too drawn out and it was yeah it was a love letter to the enterprise it was a loving look at the ship and not, it was not just the ship uh, and and this is this is the generational thing obviously but this was the return of star trek for the first time since the end of the, the original series and so that, that was a um a love letter to the fans of star trek um, more so than anything else. And it's great how, how he did it this time, where you're offered it, it's offered up, and then he just goes, beat me over, right? I, that's fantastic. It's fantastic. And, and so we get this callback to the scene yeah. from Star Trek, the motion picture. There's an Easter egg. It's the callback. Yeah. We have that same loving look at the ship, except this time it's cut short because it's for a modern audience. And, you know, we have things to do in this, yeah. in this TV episode. This isn't a feature-length film. And also yeah. it shows how Pike is willing to break the rules when necessary. Yeah. And that's the first time that he breaks the rules. Instead of waiting for the shuttle to dock and coming aboard formally, he just beams aboard. He takes a, a shortcut. Yeah. When they're talking about General Order 1, he's like, I appreciate the General Order 1 is the protocol and the way to do things, but I'm breaking the rules and breaking I'm doing it for a specific reason. And then once it's been broken, he goes, well, there's no point in adhering to it now. I'm going to break the rules again. So we yeah. see this balance and awareness. Here's the protocol. Here's the right thing to do. Here's a different action. Spock and Nuni and Singh arguing about the deflector shields. Pike makes the call and goes, no, we're going to do the wrong thing. But it's it turns out to be the right thing because it's not it's not a case of there's a binary there is one right and one wrong. Spock was advocating the right thing to do according to the protocols. Singh was outlining the right thing to do because of her intuition about the situation. They are both right things. And Pike is in that uh, inenviable position of, I have to decide what is right. And that's the captain's job. And so mm -hmm. like all of these different moments all the way through where he goes, right, our protocol is we have to do this thing. Nope. Uh, in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's, we're going to carry on doing this. Now that, yeah. now that we've interfered once, now that we know where they got the technology from, we're involved. This is no longer covered by General Order 1. Yeah. And, and the, the um, dramatic uh, triangle has already been set up now, right? Because you've got Spock on one side, you've got Singh on the other, and Pike in the middle. So... It's where the McCoy role, which was always a bit of problematic. I mean, McCoy Why was the doctor McCoy, always on the bridge. <laughs> what's he doing on the bridge all the time? But it was explained in the sense that they they were old friends as well, uh, Kirk and McCoy. So, uh, and that was a, a long-standing relationship. So there was that inf informality that was part of it. Um, but now we've got the same thing um, in a sense of, uh, I think what, what they were probably thinking in originally with the next generation of setting up with Worf and maybe Data, something along those lines, you know, the, the emotional outburst side of things and the logical rational side of things. And it never really, it, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't manifest. That dynamic. It yeah, but this dynamic is already set up. And, and I, I'm also, again, really appreciative of that. Because it's not just that it's a callback to the original series, it's what the original series did extremely well. And that's what you're calling back. And, and it's an incredibly useful tool yeah. to show tension and drama 
to show alternate ways that a situation can go. And then this is the ramification or the dramatic result of picking one of those options. Because the other person yeah. can go, if you'd done it my way, we wouldn't be in this mess. And that is an underlying thing that that can happen. And yeah. what's interesting, I think, is you had that initial thing over the deflector, uh, whether to put the deflector shields up. When Spock is giving his PowerPoint explaining the exposition, the info dump to Pike and Singh about what the mission is. And here's my PowerPoint. You go, even in the future, they are plagued by, by someone standing there with a PowerPoint going, and now, um, <laughs> and Spock and Singh again have the argument where she said, we can't leave people behind. And Spock saying, but the protocol insists that we, yeah. we do this thing. And again, Pike making this, but letting both of them have the argument. He wants to listen to both sides. The thing I'm curious about is that that's a very straightforward dynamic because we saw it in um, the original series. Mm -hmm. My number one is going to fit into that. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm very curious. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it, but even, even the mirroring of Singh's past trauma and how she gets to the the resolution of her arc within the same show that Pike is getting to the resolution of his arc, where a lot of other shows would go, no, this is Pike's episode, so we're yeah. doing his arc. Yeah. This time they went, yeah, but we can do this at the same time. You, you don't have to choose cool. one or the other. Because no. Singh, again, like Pike, where he had moments all the way through of seeing his reflection, Singh has moments all the way through where there's a bit more about her backstory, a bit more about her backstory. Uh, we get more and more a sense of who she is, why she isn't acclimatized to working with people, why she yeah. is attached to certain people. And then at the end, Pike boils it down into, you didn't trust me. Yeah, no, that, that's a great scene. That's a really good scene, yeah. And that's, that's where we get this insight into he trusts his crew but yeah. he needs them to trust him. And if you want to serve on my crew, uh, Lieutenant Singh, you need to trust me as much as I trust you. Mm -hmm. And we see that she makes that decision. She rounds that corner as well. And that is going to be her arc yeah. through the first season that she's going to be dealing with this. That we see, these aren't just done and dusted, never to be mentioned again. I They're hope not. And uh, there not. always seems to be callbacks that each time it's remember where you, you came from. And yeah. even in that scene where Pike is giving the speech to the aliens, it switches to a voice voiceover. We see what is being displayed to them. Then we see the aliens in the conference room and the aliens outside watching it. And yeah. then the crew members. And mm -hmm. again, the show is at pains to keep going back to the other members of the crew to go, these are the people you will be following. Exactly. This, this is about their past and their future and their hope. And yeah, that yeah. hopeful note that there is darkness, there is action, there, there are all these scary, strange things out there, but there's also wonder and beauty and hope. And it is such a tonal shift from the darkness and the violence and the fear of technology, the fear of the alien, the fear of others, the fear of uh, people within, that all of the other more recent sort of Star Trek projects have focused on, that it's always about fighting someone, fighting Khan, yeah. the enemy they created, fighting a, um, a former Starfleet officer, fighting a Starfleet admiral, uh, fighting a Starfleet AI that they created, fighting. Why is it always about fighting an enemy who's trying to destroy you? It's the lazy default for for people thinking what at what is what is drama, what is action. It is the lazy default every time. Um, um, so I find this a, a, an absolutely joyous show. It was smart. Yeah. It was well written. It had moments of pathos. It had uh, moments of drama. It had moments of humor. It yes. was gorgeously realized, but um, the aesthetic is sort of halfway between Archer's Enterprise and Kirk's Enterprise in terms of what, how the ship looks. But obviously with 
modern technology representing and showing us all of these things so it doesn't look like a set made out of plastic with flashing bulbs in it yeah there's that there's a great little quip that pike throws out in response to spock talking about when spock mentions that the, the vulcans have mastered you know first contact is and pike says something along the lines of as you keep telling us or something like that it was very good it's a nice callback yeah and there again it's it's not a show without tension it's not that the crew is all happy oh. and agrees with one another but it's not a um oh we need someone to argue the other side of this i'm setting up directly in opposition to you they're furthering a, a position which makes sense it's not mm -hmm. a well i'm i'm setting up a false argument essentially for dramatic tension it never yeah. felt hollow that way spock is logic and rules bound and so he advances that argument and yeah. it makes perfect sense i just i thought it was an absolutely fantastic show i'm really excited for this season me too i mean the thing was you know i'd finished watching picard i hadn't finished watching it by that point but i knew it was dropping here in canada on on the thursday and 20 years ago i would have been right there watching it instantly and i didn't i was doing other stuff i didn't bother watching and so it was like maybe a couple days later that i went to it on on demand and, and just and watched it and i was like wow um very very unexpected i mean i, I had high hopes for it but i, I think i was holding off because I, I didn't want to be disappointed and unfortunately you're going to be traveling so you're not going to have the opportunity to watch a lot of this i know i know very frustrating <laughs> um not really but i mean you'll be there when i get back and so i'm looking forward to that well when you when you get back i think it would be great if we uh watch the episodes and, and have a talk about them because yeah for the first time in a long time i am anticipating having a positive viewing experience and watching a show that you and i can talk about and go we really enjoyed this these yeah. are the aspects we liked yeah no kidding no kidding. And you know, if you look at the original series, there were some pretty serious dud episodes oh. and it's going to happen, right? But, and I think that happens with every show. There are going to be good episodes, bad episodes. Even in a good episode, there are going to be quibbles or maybe some things that don't gel uh, or that we don't react well to. Mm -hmm. In bad episodes, there might still be really good moments. I think the idea that it is either a good show or a bad show, again, a binary that is, I know. is meaningless. Um, but I am so positive mm -hmm. about this. It, it, sig it is signaling really good things, unlike yeah. Discovery, which I had in the first five minutes, I was worried about where the show was going and it was born out over three and a half seasons. Ah, oh, it was, it was chaos from the start and, and, and what was probably for me what was so problematic was the background that sets everything up was not well thought out and and so did not invite um the proper layout of what this was going to be it, it seemed to be very very chaotic very all over the place it isolated our main character um so there's there's no uh you know, Burnham is, is, well, Burnham basically, and yeah, the logic of it just didn't make sense that she well, would be busted down for doing something that was quite clearly what she had to do. Um, um, the, the first two episodes of Discovery, not featuring Discovery. Then yeah. the third episode, when she arrives on Discovery, she is separated and isolated from the rest of the crew. She yeah. isn't trusted by the rest of the crew. And yet we're still meant to identify with her as the main character. Yeah. And, and then there's mutinies on the bridge that she tries to run. And it's like, you, I mean, to miss the point of the original series or the original creation that is Star Trek, you couldn't, you couldn't have a textbook do a better job of missing all the points. Right. <laughs> and then, and then the ship itself and it's instantaneous travel missed the point. Um, so, and then all the, you know, I, I would think 
psychologically, you would be driven to psychosis on that ship because the bridge is just grotesque. Um, all the lights, um, the gunmetal stuff, um, the color palette, um, the tonal thing, everything would just drive people insane. So I'm not surprised they're all screaming at each other because all of us would. But it, it's very interesting, like, even the instant teleportation of the ship. When we think of Strange New Worlds, they go to warp and it cuts to several hours or days later yeah. and Spock walks in, they have a quick scene and it's, we are there. You go, there is discernibly no narrative uh, problem with doing it, with cutting out the intervening travel time, except the intervening travel time allows you to have scenes like Spock going in to talk to Pike. The, yeah. There's a reason that you don't have to show it if you don't need it. If you need it, it gives you room in the narrative to insert something. Yeah. But if it can instantly teleport, you go, why do they ever fly around anywhere? Just sit at the space dock. Oh, there's a thing over there. Teleport, done it. Fly back, teleport back. Right, yeah. we'll sit at space dock. Well, it, it, it's pinball, pinball plotting, right? You're just bouncing from one thing to another. And so it grows increasingly hectic. And, you know, the, the explanations are all shouted at each other and they're incomprehensible because they're, they're dropping jargon all over the place. And, you know, we're supposed to follow all of this. And, and there's no point in following it all because it really doesn't matter in the end anyways, because Burnham's going to save everybody. So it's everything about that was just, yeah, it was it was crushing uh, for that franchise to actually get to that point. But, you know, Pike is definitely the main character of this show. Yeah. But the, the issue, there's such a strong focus on all of the other characters that you feel the ensemble nature. Yeah, finally. Whereas, finally. And, and not everything in the universe revolves around Pike. Spock has to print. Um, there's the relationship, are they f uh, familiarity and friendship between the doctor and Nurse Chapel? the other relation like these things all exist and you go pike it, it's not that the whole universe is revolving around pike yeah and interestingly i like chapel more the second time around than i did the first time around of watching i didn't i something yeah something was weird at the first the first time through but the second time no i liked her she was good well about her car it, she is very peppy she is very zesty mm -hmm. and funny and quippy and you're like that's great and then there's a wonderful moment where when she's having that discussion with Singh, because she had her, her snarky comeback about, yeah, you boss a ship if we're going to be reductive uh, or simplistic. And you go, she's, she's obviously very intelligent and yeah. snarky, and that's brilliant. But when she goes to give the injection to Singh and Singh has refused a sedative, her demeanor completely changes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is still entirely in character, but now it's, it, it's sort of related to that doctor uh, first do no harm. She knows she is about to inflict enormous pain on someone unnecessarily, but yeah. it is the patient's wish and she treats it very seriously. Yeah. And so it doesn't come across as dissonant, but she suddenly becomes much more serious, much more focused beforehand. It was, oh yeah, we're just doing this and we're, because it was relaxed, but hang on, this is this is going to be bad. Mm. And that switch, that moment, I think, shows so much more about her as a character. And then later on, when she's chasing the alien down and she's laughing her head off about this, her again, love for life, the, the yeah, that enthusiasm yeah. in this TV show, it is infectious. But Steve, we've, we've had a, a nice long chat about this. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, that was a great fun. It was great fun. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, that so much of it um, just left a warm glow, if you know what I mean. It's, it's, and that is so, for me anyways, it's so freaking rare these days. So it was, you know, it's no surprise I watched it twice. Oh, I also uh, just, I really like the uh, Uhuru uh, character, the actor, actress. Um, yeah, she, she just beams. She beams. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, but even then, she had that brilliant line where she bumps into the alien in the yeah. turbo lift. 
and because she's been listening in on everything that's going on yeah. and she's assimilated so much information about their culture, talks to him about his local sports team. Yeah, and it perfect. Is, but it's a wonderful moment in essentially a dead scene of the chase round the, for not only humor, but it, so it's a humorous scene. It's part of the chase scene. It's part of the action scene. It's part of that dramatic thing of how are we going to get this thing to spark? But also it allows her to shine yeah. and show why she's a prodigy, why she is so trusted, why yeah. she's on the enterprise. She can do something that other people can't. And it is effortless for her. Yeah. yeah. And so again, a wonderful character moment yeah. built into a, an action sequence that didn't involve violence and fighting. Yeah. Who knew, right? Uh, so on that note, thank you very much, Steve. For those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I hope to see you in the next one. Yeah. And I hope to see some of you in um, France. Bye.